In many ways, San Francisco is a very, very wealthy city. Yes, it's about policy. It is、mm. about how we approach this issue. The people who live on our streets in the most horrendous conditions you've ever seen, worse than Bangladesh, worse than anything that you've ever seen. It is not a result of poverty, and we need to get out of that mindset. Putting somebody in a home in the condition that they're in right now will do exactly nothing except possibly make it worse. Praise be Jesus Christ. This is Father Robert McTagg of the Society of Jesus, your daily host for the Catholic Current, where we bring Christ to the world and the world to Christ. You're listening to us on the Station of the Cross Catholic Studios, your local radio station, and the iCatholic Radio mobile app, where we proclaim the fullness of truth with clarity and charity. As always, let's start with prayer. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Almighty God, through the intercession of Saint Ignatius Loyola, we ask that you pour forth your Holy Spirit upon us, a spirit of discernment. They might hear your voice and obey your command. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Well, friends, there's a lot of there's almost an industry, if I can use that word, of of indignation and anxiety when when different groups are are being oppressed or suffering violence. And and there's a, a wisdom and a justice and a charity to that. I'm wondering where the indignation happens when it comes to Christians, and in particular particular Christians in Africa. Point of contrast is. Uh, people in the Middle East are shooting at each other again, and it seems that academia,、uh, mainstream media, politics are favoring one group over another. No one's talking about the Christians in the Holy Land, and no one's talking about the Christians in Africa. I want to sort that out. My returning guest is an、uh, an author, a blogger, a journalist. He's an expert on Islam and Middle Eastern affairs. I recommend to you his book called Crucified Again. Exposing Islam's new war on Christians. Raymond Ibrahim, welcome back to the Catholic Current. Greetings, Father McTague. Very good to be with you again. Raymond, it, it seems to me that that people have been killing each other in, in the Middle East since since Cain and Abel. In a certain sense, that that's not new. What's happening in the present round of violence? It seems that mainstream media, very outspoken politicians, and an awful lot of American academia is citing exclusively. Uh, on the for the case of of the Palestinians, I've tried to understand what's going on there, and and I gave up. I can't figure it out. I don't know who the players are. I know th- to say which ones were in the black hats and which ones were in the white hats is is too simplistic. They're good guys and bad guys everywhere and in every group. Help us to understand what's going on right now、uh, in Israel and and Palestine, because I want to use that as a point of departure for discussion of when Christians suffer around the world. Sure, very good.、Um, so the overall context in in the, in the infamous Arab-Israeli conf-、uh, conflict that's going on and, and recently flared out again. Is you have the state of Israel where it is、um, having been born around forty seven forty eight, and then you have the so called Palestinians, and that's actually it's funny because a lot of people argue and say you can't even call them Palestinians because that indicates nationhood and there never was a nation, they're just Arabs who lived in that part of the Ottoman Empire before it was you know taken over by colonial powers etc etc, and、um, So you have this、uh, conflict that the Palestinians are not being absorbed by their fellow Arab Muslim neighboring nations, who they are you know, very closely related to. And, and as I said before, there was no idea as you're a Palestinian.、Uh, you could have the people there could have been merged with Syrians and Jordanians and Arabs and so forth、uh, in the general context, but they're not being.、Um, They're not being absorbed, and that's for political purposes from the Arab Muslim world. They're being used as tools, weapons against Israel. So they,、uh, lamentably, they're the ones who are stuck in the middle. The, the average general Palestinian, and then it's all exacerbated because you have Hamas, you have Hezbollah, you know, bona fide terrorist organizations who are operating there and engaged in terrorist activities against Israel. And then when Israel defends itself or gets provoked into conflict from these terrorist organizations. Um, the, the the same terrorist groups actually go in and merge and hide amongst the civilian Palestinian population, and so you get this what's called collateral damage, unfortunately.、Mm-hmm. And then that's of course what the media and、uh, everyone else grabs onto and ignores the general context of a sovereign nation defending itself against terrorist attacks、um, and doing whatever it can, and the fact that the terrorists themselves are using the Palestinian people as human shields. Um, making it very difficult for Israel to actually distinguish and separate, and it's being done intentionally.、Uh, so that's really the situation、uh, that's going on.、Uh, the in, and also, you know, to take it a step deeper, 
and let's see it from an Islamic theological paradigm, um, the clerics and Muslim clerics all around the world, Palestinians and non-Palestinians, have made it clear that there can never be peace with Israel, that Israel must be uh, pushed into the sea, as they say, and driven out, and, uh, and they even use genocidal terms and so forth. Um, so that really obviously doesn't help when the whole theological matrix behind their logic is such that there can be no peace and really puts Israel in a hard and difficult situation uh, if it wants to exist. Mm-hmm. So that's uh, And this is why it's been going on for decades, the Arab-Israeli conflict. And this is why I don't really necessarily see any light at the end of the tunnel. I, just, I, I foresee more of this, um, unfortunately. And, and it's due to this uh, you know, stance from the Muslim population around the world, mm-hmm. the Arab ones specifically, at not wanting peace at any cost. Um, and I, I, you'll recall, you know, they, they engage in deceptions. Yasser, Yasser Arafat, for example, you'll, uh, the PLO leader from way mm-hmm. back, um, there's a time where he made a peace um, with uh, Israel and he was criticized for it. And then he said something that was very cryptic and most people wouldn't understand it. But he said something, I'm, I'm merely copying the Hudayba pact that the prophet did. And uh, long story short, Muhammad at one point made peace with pagans who were who were his theological enemies but mm-hmm. muhammad only did it temporarily because he was weak and the idea is once i'm strong enough i will renege and i will go on the offensive hmm. so you see i i find that this this fascinating because as i said in in the popular what's trying to be foisted upon popular imagination is there's one group of innocent victims thirsting for justice and there's one group that's rapacious oppressors right and Again, the, the story is more complicated than that. Now, are are there are there innocent people suffering on both sides of of the line? Yes, of course, because and that's one of the reasons why war, especially modern war, is is so horrible. Let let's shift the conversation a little bit first. I want to remind our, our listeners: my returning guest today is Raymond Ibrahim. He's an expert on Middle East and Islam. Please do read his book called Crucified Again. Exposing Islam's New War on Christians. You, you ha- have been tracking the persecution of Christians a- around the world. Sadly, it, it doesn't seem that you're going to be running out of, of new events anytime soon. And while people you know, rightly are concerned, say, about uh, you know the, the Tibetans or the Uyghurs and, and so on, there seems to be a resounding silence about the, the, the brutal persecution of of Christians, especially in the African continent. What, why is that? Why does there seem to be selective indignation and selective concern in popular culture and mass media? Well, at first, uh, that is precisely why one must uh, take with a grain of salt what the media says, going back, let's say, to the Arab-Palestinian conflict, uh, the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, uh, because it is very selective and there is it is very narrative-driven um, so the end narrative that they want to present is is what um, is what decides what they will report or what conflict they will report, and so I find it uh, going along what you're saying. I find it ironic that you know at, at at root base the Israeli and Palestinian conflict is very I don't want to use the word mundane, but it's very mm-hmm. logical. It's very standard. You have a territorial mm-hmm. dispute. Uh, you have terrorist attacks. You have a nation trying to uh, combat terrorist attacks, then you have collateral damage in between. So all of this is uh, nothing spectacular. It's lamentable, but it's not mm-hmm. something strange. But uh, so I find it interesting that, and yet, when you have an exponentially greater number of people who are mm-hmm. being slaughtered, and not for any mundane reasons, but for mm-hmm. highly existential or actually mm-hmm. theological reasons, because they're Christians and mm-hmm. no other reason, that doesn't even get reported. People don't know that. You know, I, I I was reading a, a story recently that a, a very prominent former presidential candidate said, we shall defend the rights of Muslims around the world. Well, you know, I'm, I'm all in favor of, of human rights being defended because I'm a human myself and I, I like my human rights. But I, I don't see any ringing announcement. We, we have to protect the interests of Christians uh, around the world. Let's speculate for a moment. What would happen, say, in mainstream media if someone very prominent in American politics uh, called for global vigil- vigilance in the defense of, of the rights of Christians. What do you think would happen next? <laughs> There'd be a lot of so-called triggered people out there uh, because that just flies in the face of the mainstream acceptable narrative. Uh, mm-hmm. You have to remember the mainstream narrative is that Christians are always the oppressors. 
specifically right. if they're white, of course. Uh, this is the quintessential toxic patriarchal image, which is a, a white European or Western Christian male specifically. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. to ever present them as the victims just completely flies in the face of what um, people have been so for generations really indoctrinated into believing it's the antithesis, even though it is, right. of course, the reality. Um, we get these annual reports all the time of hundreds of millions of Christians who are being persecuted in loathsome ways, not just not, you know, it's, it's Western or American ears. When you say perse Christian persecution, they think, you know, the war on Christmas or, or things of that nature. No, I'm talking about being murdered and slaughtered and raped and imprisoned and your church is being bombed and burned and banned and your, you know, Bibles and, and Christian literature being confiscated and burned. That kind of persecutions, um, hundreds of millions of Christians are experiencing every day, and yet that is that's not a news item, and this is well known and well documented. Well, let's take up the thread of that conversation in the next segment, Raymond. Friends, when we come back, we're going to continue our conversation with expert on the Middle East affairs and Islam, Raymond Ibrahim. We're asking the question: Are Christians being ignored in Africa? It's an important conversation. Sadly, you're not likely to hear it in very many other places. In the next segment, we're going to start our walk through the map of Africa, talk about where Christians are persecuted. Remember, our rallying cry here at the Catholic Current is Christus Mundo, Mundus Christo, bringing Christ to the world and the world to Christ. We do it because our Lord says so, for the greater glory of God, the love of our neighbor, and the salvation of our own soul. We'll be back in two minutes. Stay with us. Jesus 911, now weekdays at 2 p.m. Eastern. My name is Jesse Romero. I'm a retired Los Angeles cop. I'm a Catholic lay evangelist. My show on spiritual warfare is called Jesus 911, where you got three retired L.A. cops, Ruben Nava, Eddie Chavez, talking about the Catholic faith and teaching you spiritual warfare, how to defend yourself against the devil, the world, and the flesh. Catch the Soul Patrol, Jesus 911, 2 p.m. Eastern, 11 a.m. Pacific, on the Station of the Cross and the iCatholic Radio mobile app. You're listening to The Catholic Current with Father Robert Mateig from the Station of the Cross Catholic Media Network. Stay connected with the show, our guests, and topics by following the show on Twitter and Gab. Just search for The Catholic Current. Praise be Jesus Christ. This is Father Robert McTague of the Society of Jesus, your daily host for the Catholic Current, where we bring Christ to the world and the world to Christ. You're listening to us on the Station of the Cross Studios, your local radio station, and the iCatholic Radio mobile app, where we proclaim the fullness of truth with clarity and charity. My returning guest today is Raymond Ibrahim. He's an expert on Middle Eastern and Islamic affairs author of the important book called Crucified Again, Exposing Islam's New War on Christians. We're asking the questions, are Christians being ignored, ignored in Africa? And Raymond, I know that the short answer to that is yes. I want to jump around a, a bit of the, the map of, of Africa. So let's start up, up in the north in Egypt. There have been Christians in Egypt since that there have been Christians. It's an mm -hmm. ancient, ancient community with a long, long noble tradition it's not doing too well these days, and it hasn't been doing too well for, for quite some time. Fill us in on the details, please. Sure, Father Mateg. As you note, uh, it, it was one of the earliest Christian nations and um, heavily Christian, actually. In fact, uh, as you know, if you go back to the Christian councils, the early fathers and so forth, mm -hmm. so many of them come from Egypt. And most right. people don't realize that, such as um, Anas, you know, Athanasius and Nicene right. Creed and all that. Mm -hmm. um, anyway, Islam comes in in the 7th century, sweeps through st in North Africa, beginning, of course, in Egypt, ends up in Morocco, into Spain and so forth. Um, mm. Egypt uh, just completely gets devastated. And this is found in the primary sources, including the Islamic mm -hmm. primary sources, who make it a point to extol how the Muslim victors vanquished the Christian infidels, destroyed their churches, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. Um, they took the jizya, all of, uh, which is all based on Quran 929, fight the people of the book, Christians and Jews, mm -hmm. until they pay jizya tribute and feel themselves subdued. Okay, mm -hmm. so that goes on. And um, the Christian, and, and, and you know, there's so many different epics that people are un unaware of. So under the Mamluk uh, Empire, for example, who, and the Mamluks were basically slave soldiers. 
who took mm-hmm. over Egypt. The Christians there, this is actually when the, the Coptic language died off because they were forbidden and banned um, from using it. Uh, um, and, and this is why now it's just uh, relegated to liturgical context. And um, mm-hmm. Egyptians, Copts, speak Arabic, of course. Um, mm-hmm. and, and their churches, again, were destroyed and all this. Even people like Saladin, who's often presented in, um, in the West as some kind of magnanimous Muslim ruler, you dig in the real sources and you find that he, would, he commanded that all Coptic churches have mud thrown on them, all their crosses be broken off. He had uh, Christians crucified and, and so forth. So this sort of thing goes on and on and on. And then uh, Egypt goes from a 95% or actually 99%. Uh, it was all Christian, actually, when Islam came, except for a, a small Jewish minority, mostly in Alexandria. But after, from that point, it's, it goes down to what they say now. I mean, if you listen to the government, it's as little as 5%. Uh, the cops themselves say they're 15%. Most people go 10%. Okay, hmm. but now you come to the modern context, and it's still the same thing. You have, there's, and this, and what I'm saying really applies to every Muslim nation. Uh, but Egypt is a good paradigm. Uh, so what you have is you got the government, which itself enforces certain what we would call discriminatory measures. The Constitution, for example, says that Sharia, which is Islamic law, is a principal source of legislation. That itself is problematic since Sharia is inherently anti-Christian. So you can imagine how, how that sort of thing works itself in, in legislation. And from there, mm-hmm. you can see as one example, um, you know, Sharia, Islamic law, is against building churches. You can never right. build a new church. You're not even supposed to renovate it. Uh, you can let pre-existing ones stay there and so forth. So you, from here, you learn why it's like pulling teeth for cops in Egypt to build churches or even renovate them. And, and, and I just saw a report about Egypt boasting of I don't know how many thousands of new mosques it opened. And yet when a rumor uh, appears that a church or a house is being used as a church, Muslims riot. Anyway, so you have the, the authorities and the constitution. Then you have the mob, which goes to that latter point who, if they see some sort of infraction, like a church being opened, or a Coptic Christian man dating a Muslim woman, which again, it goes against Sharia, they riot and rise up. And maybe you recall this 70-year-old Christian woman who was stripped naked and paraded in mm-hmm, Egypt mm-hmm. and mocked and spat on. Her crime is that her son was accused of dating a Muslim woman. Um, and she, of course, never got justice, even though all the men who did that to her are well known and their names and their faces are recorded. Uh, Raymond, that, that, was that, all that story of that public humiliation and violent abuse of, of an innocent Christian elderly woman in Egypt, if I were going to, which, where would I look for public denunciation from Western feminists? Uh, <laughs> a, a they don't even movement? know about it. Yeah. Uh, where, where would I find exactly. that? You're not going to uh, find it uh, okay. because she doesn't fit. I wonder fit. why that is. Uh, she doesn't fit. Well, because only certain... Uh, people fit the profile of uh, ah, sympathy. Uh, okay. Well, it, again, it, it's, it's that sense of uh, a selective indignation. Friends, I'm speaking with Raymond exactly. Ibrahim. He's an expert on Islam and the Middle East. Uh, do read his book called Crucified Again, Exposing Islam, uh, New War uh, on Christians. So, And I understand that the, the statistics overall in, in Africa – of churches being destroyed, of Christians being butchered, they're, they're staggering. Can you fill us on, on the latest numbers? I'm, I'm sure you've got more current information than I have. Sure. So I, I was just giving you the soft stuff uh, in Egypt, which is churches and discrimination. Um, but even in Egypt, you get the slaughter uh, and from ISIS, but not even ISIS, even just radical so-called Muslims. And the most recent one actually happened about a month ago in, in uh, Giza, um, mm-hmm. or I'm sorry, in Gaza. Mm-hmm. Uh, where uh, ISIS, they produced a video, and in it, they have a Christian man kneeling, and they shoot him in the back of the head. But before they do that, they actually quote Quran uh, 929, which is about mm-hmm. taking tribute or money and mm-hmm. how they must feel humiliated. And then he shoots him in the back of the head. Now, going down, let's say, sub-Saharan Africa, this is mm-hmm. a nightmare. And let's just mm-hmm. begin in, in Nigeria, where you have a bona fide genocide going on, uh, against Christians, and I'm looking now at some figures um, mm-hmm. and numbers. So, and I can uh, I can send you the reports. Uh, anyway, sure. <clears throat> according to one report, um, it just between January and April of this year, okay, mm-hmm. so just four months, you had 1,500 Christians were hacked to death. So that comes to about 370 Christians in a month, four months straight. No, how many people in the West even heard of that? They heard that about mm-hmm. 248 Palestinians were killed. 
and that was mm-hmm. a huge number, and we dwelled mm-hmm. on it. But yeah, but then now go back a little further. In just the last decade, thirty-two thousand Christians in Nigeria were butchered, um, and thirteen thousand churches were destroyed by Allah Akbar screaming Muslims since just two thousand sixteen. I mean, these are dramatic stories. And again, keep in mind what, what when Palestinians are being are are killed. You know, that's it's it's in the context of defending their nation, Israel defending itself against terrorism. It's nothing spectacular. Yet here you have people who are being slaughtered for no reason other than their religious identity. In other words, that's a real story. And yet this is not being reported and very few people know about it. You know, it really does break my heart that. There, as I said, there, there's a there's a resounding silence. I'm 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 more informed than, than most people are, but even even I, I, it's hard to keep up with. I'll put it that way. Yeah. It's really hard to keep up with that that uh, that that whole that whole cell slaughter. And again, I, Raymond, I turn to you as an expert because you follow these things much more closely than, than I'm able to. Is anyone speaking about this? Is anyone trying to draw attention? Sound the alarm? Yeah, human human rights organizations who are objective and uh, don't mind if you're Christian, uh, mm-hmm. but if you are actually being persecuted, they'll they'll talk about it. But as far as politicians or big name uh, people, even you know so called mm-hmm. conservatives or Republicans, I don't I don't hear much of anything. Or maybe once in a while, if it's appropriate, a passing sentence or something like that. But nothing mm-hmm. active is being done about it at all, okay. and that's why it's getting worse. Worse and worse. It's uh, it started in Nigeria. It's really now spreading all throughout sub-Saharan Africa. I mean, countries like Mozambique, Central African Republic, Mali, uh, the Republic of Congo, Burkina Faso. These areas uh, are the Christians there are being terrorized and slaughtered by Muslims again for no less of a reason than their just religious identity because they're Christians. And none of this, uh, you know, the people who can give you all the facts and figures and the details about what's happening to Palestinians can't even, in the most generic sense, even acknowledge what uh, I'm discussing, which seems to me exponentially worse when it comes to the scale of human suffering and human deaths. Right. And it's what, what, what I find staggering is, you know, there, there's, a, there's been shooting on both sides. I haven't heard, uh, and I'm sure I would have, you know, for example, I don't hear anything about uh, Christians in Africa anywhere, um, you know, re- retaliating. Uh, against persecutors. Have you heard anything to that effect at all? No, no. And you bring up a very important point, um, you know, just again to show you how bad it is. Uh, and first, I'm going to read to you a quick quote, which um, it came from Joe Biden, actually. Uh, and, and it was amazing because it goes along with something that you said earlier um, about, you know, picking and choosing who's who's innocent and who's not innocent and how there mm-hmm. seems to be an emphasis on Muslims. So Biden on um, May 16th issued a very brief video, and I'll just read a small excerpt from it. He said, All people should be able to practice their faith with dignity without fear of harassment or violence. Sounds good. Continue. Okay. We will, defend the, we will defend the right of all. Notice the word all. All people mm-hmm. should. And mm-hmm. now we will defend the right of all as we stand with you. Good. Continue. That's why I ended this shameful Muslim travel ban. And that's why this administration will speak out for religious freedom for all people, including Uyghurs in China, Rohingya in Burma. We also mm-hmm. believe Palestinians and Israelis deserve to live in, a sa- in safety and security and enjoy equal measure of freedom, prosperity, and democracy. My administration is going to continue engaging Palestinians and Israelis, etc. Notice he begins with, you know, we believe in all people. Mm-hmm, and mm-hmm. then every single example he gives is of Muslims. Right. Um, you know, so what, where's did he? Why not say one word about the exponentially greater number of Christians who are actually being persecuted um, in ways that are worse, in fact, than uh, the people that he did mention? Well, you know, in in a lot of religious circles now, words like you know, uh, diversity and safe places and inclusion and welcoming and pro- pronoun hospitality, et cetera, et cetera. And, you know, I'm hearing precious little about safe spaces uh, for, for Christians and especially for Catholics. Remember, was it two years ago, three years ago now, there was that horrific bombing uh, in, cathed- in the cathedral in Sri Lanka during Easter Sunday morning? And they couldn't even be acknowledged by the media or politics as, as Christians, much less Catholics. They were referred to as 
Easter worshipers, as if somehow <laughs> the very that. idea of, of being a Christian, it needs to be removed from polite discourse. So when I hear Easter worshipers, I, I think of, of people on what used to be known as Mother's Day, uh, you know, on announcing on Twitter, you know, you know, celebrating all birthday persons. And that would be, uh, and that would be, uh, it just, it just doesn't make any sense to me. If we give up on the language to describe the suffering of Christians, then the suffering of Christians is going to be unacknowledged, and it's also going to be unimpeded. And we, we can't, we just, we cannot have that. Friends, when we come back. We're going to continue our conversation with Raymond Ibrahim. Please do check out his his book called Crucified Again. In the next segment, we're going to continue our conversation talking about uh, persecution of Christians, not only in Africa, around the world. Look for this episode on your favorite podcasting platform. And if you know someone who needs to hear about this important conversation about persecuted Christians, be sure to share this episode with them after the show. Be part of the conversation. Follow what we're following by following us on Gab. That's G-A-B dot com. Our channel is The Catholic Current. We'll be right back. Stay with us. This is The Catholic Current from the Station of the Cross Catholic Media Network. Catch up on an episode you've missed or share them with your family or friends. The Catholic Current is podcasted wherever you enjoy listening. Apple Podcasts, Google Play, Spotify, Stitcher, TuneIn, and the iCatholic Radio mobile app. Praise be Jesus Christ. This is Father Robert McTagg of the Society of Jesus, your daily host for the Catholic Current, where we bring Christ to the world and the world to Christ. You're listening to us from the Station of the Cross Studios, your local radio station, and the iCatholic Radio mobile app, where we proclaim the fullness of truth with clarity and charity. Our returning guest today is Raymond Ibrahim. He's an expert in Middle Eastern affairs and Islam. Do read his important book called Crucified Again, Exposing Islam's New War on Christians. Raymond, we were talking in the last segment about persecution of Christians in Africa, how they're going unnoticed. And yet there was a recent federal announcement that the, the present federal paradigm would be securing the, the rights uh, of all, especially Muslims. And he mentioned different Muslim groups around the world, uh, the Uyghurs in China, uh, the Rohingya in Myanmar. You had something to add about that. What was that, please? Absolutely. Uh, so, so you were, you know, you were saying, for example, how um, have I heard of Christians who are being persecuted retaliating? And my answer, of course, is no. And so now the people, the groups that the West and Biden and, and the mainstream media focus on as being um, abused and persecuted, as as in the Uyghurs and the Rohingya and the Palestinians, what they're not telling you is that those people, like most Muslim minorities who live somehow around non-Muslims are actually engaged in terrorist activity, subversion, and constantly agitating. Um, you know, so the so the Uyghurs in China, of course, we we're now you know to us the Chinese are are you know the, the communists and so forth. And I agree. And um, and it, one should not necessarily believe what they say, but they are actually issued a lot of reports of how the Uyghurs engage in terrorist activity. And for someone who who keeps a you know track on Muslim behavior throughout the centuries, I'm not so I I would believe that because mm-hmm. it's the same thing with the Rohingya. And uh, you know when you get when you get uh, you know, when you get Buddhists actually f- cracking down on you, it makes you wonder, you know, the, the other people being cracked down on are, can't be that innocent. And so I find it, again, it's it's part of that topsy-turvy approach where right. the one the groups that we do focus on, not only um, mm-hmm. are they not being attacked as bad as, let's say, Christians, but they're actually provoking and starting this in many ways. And, and we don't when we don't get that. Right, you know, Raymond. Of course, you know, no one is advocating for the harming of, of innocent people. No, uh, no, no one is calling for for uh, for genocide of, of any kind. But again, I keep coming back to the idea of selective indignation, yes. and there seems to be right. precious little indignation. Uh, on behalf of persecuted Christians anywhere. For example, you know, uh, white South African farmers 
who are Christians who have a long tradition of being able to grow food anywhere. They've got a ferocious work ethic. They're being slaughtered. Not only is their slaughter not being reported, they can't get visas. No one wants to take them in. Even in countries that, that are, you know, stand at their borders and saying all are welcome, nobody wants white South African farmers. I suspect it's because they're, they're Christians. What, what do you think? Well, after the, uh, well, it's something else you said. They're also white. Um, mm -hmm. and, and horror of horror, by being South Africans, that means they have a colonial past. So they are just the worst of the worst, and they have no right to open their mouth about anything. Mm -hmm. I'm not telling you what I think. I'm just saying how, how right. no, you, know, I, I the, the, you know, the people who claim they care about human rights uh, think. And so it's we see it's the same thing, you know, wherever you look. And this is, I guess, the ultimate point, And you get the media telling you about a death. You have to understand. And like you say, you know, all deaths are bad. But mm -hmm. they're telling when they tell you about a death, you have to know that there's countless deaths, sometimes much worse that they're not telling you about. So obviously, it's just all about, um, you know, their agenda. And you can we, we saw this dramatically here in America with the whole BLM, the mm -hmm. George Floyd. Uh, so if if one a black man get, who's engaged in criminal activity gets shot by a policeman, that gets nonstop. But the fact that hundreds of innocent blacks, including children, die yearly uh, by um, you know stray bullets from other blacks, that's not worth mentioning. We don't. That's nothing to you, talk you, about. You, you would but, almost think that the news stories were presented to to promote an agenda or a narrative, but that would of be course. <laughs> that would be that would be too darkly cynical. Shame on me for even thinking. Maybe I should. That's that's too conspiratorial. That that, well, 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 clearly it, it is that. Friends, I'm speaking with Raymond Ibrahim. He is an expert on Islam and Middle Eastern affairs. Check out his book called Crucified Again: Exposing Islam's New War on Christians. You mentioned a lot of other African countries that that don't get in. The news very often in the West. Now I know that persecution is fierce against Christians in, in Egypt, in, in Nigeria. Where are some of the other countries where Christians are suffering? Oh, Pakistan. Uh, you know, if you want to leave Africa and, and go into Asia, Pakistan's a nightmare. Mm -hmm. And that place, it's it's really compounded in a very um, you know disgusting way the things that Christians suffer because there's a lot of humiliation and sort mm -hmm. of um, uh, you know uh, the abuse is not just uh, physical or it's just it's psychological almost mm -hmm. and, it, mm -hmm. and, it, and it's and it's and it goes to the very top in their constitution and in mo a lot of it um, uh, uh, circulates around their blasphemy laws. Okay. Which, oh, I was uh, going to ask you about that. Please, please spend some time with that, because I think because I know every now and again in, in the UN there's something about hey, you know we we don't want people to be upset, so we got to have these blasphemy laws. Like, okay, I I think blasphemy is bad, but but this is something this is something different, isn't it? Of course. Well, the blasphemy laws are basically let's say Pakistan, which is really spearheading this movement, um, but other Muslim countries, of course, do it. But it's basically a way of silencing any criticism about Islam because Lord knows there's a lot that one can poke holes at. And so mm -hmm. they have created a law where you can't say anything negative about Muhammad, okay, even though their own scriptures are full of you know, questionable issues about Muhammad. Mm -hmm. And, uh, of course, nothing about Islam, nothing about the Quran, nothing about anything that is Islamic. If you do, it's, uh, it's, well, it's blasphemy and you know, death, instant death, or at least imprisonment. Um, you know, a, a Christian couple was recently released after, I think, a decade in prison. And that's supposed to be some sort of victory. You know, their whole life has been, have been living in a dungeon, essentially, in Pakistan. Because, And oftentimes what happens, and they know this, it's not because uh, they even blaspheme. It's the fact that there's some vendetta. Uh, they have a quarrel with some Muslim. Some Muslim doesn't like him for whatever. And all they have to do is accuse them. And that's the end of it. And then the Muslim mob rises up and the clerics start shrieking for their death. And then whether, whatever, whatever, whether they like it or not, authorities arrest them. And that's the end of it. Um, so it's, it's, uh, but it's ironic because, as you point out, here in the West, you know, we're doing the same thing to ourselves. Um, mm -hmm. Inadvertently, we're censoring ourselves, let's say, on the topic of Islam. And the question right. you have to remember, it's not about uh, me, me getting up and mocking Muhammad, going na 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 na. No, it's if I just pull up, uh, if I write a scholarly, you know, article full of references from purely Islamic and Arabic sources, that's blasphemy because it presents them in a negative way, uh, even though it's an objective pre you know, presentation based on the sources. Right. So it's it's uh, you know people will think you're mocking it or. Like that one, um, I think, pastor in Florida a few years ago, I think he burned a Quran 
or something. I mean, that's that's on an a- amateur level. But what they do is they silence free thinking. They silence free speech on Islam. And we, of course, here in the West are seeing the same sort of thing, um, right. but not just on Islam, but on any number of important, um, meaningful topics. So this, uh, you know, this war on free speech, uh, you it, you can really see it you know, when people talk about a red green axis or alliance, meaning the socialist, communist, Islamic, you definitely see it in that sense, because they both have a, an agenda to just shut you down uh, from speaking and thinking about anything that, uh, you know, goes against their agenda. Raymond, I want to f- shift the focus of the conversation, because the, the persecution of Christians in Africa and really around the world, it is a very terrible thing. And I think Americans tell themselves with a kind of sense of normalcy bias. Well, it certainly couldn't happen here. It certainly couldn't happen in the West. It couldn't happen in what we call civilized countries. But now now let, let's look at France. Church buildings and, and Christians, Catholics in particular, they're having a hard time in France uh, these days. Have you been following these stories? Sure, I have. And, um, you know, uh, to really emphasize where, where, I, where I think you're going, um, as you know, I think for a decade I've been writing Muslim persecution of Christian reports, and uh, and it just uh, I, I get all the stories I can from around the world on that theme, and most of them actually were from Africa and Asia and the Middle East and so forth. It's interesting because I'm getting more and more now, which are straight from Europe. Um, mm-hmm. So you're getting Muslims persecuting Christians in Europe, in France, in Germany, in uh, Sweden. Mm-hmm. Um, in I mean, these are in the UK, of course. Um, mm-hmm. And it, it's to me, it makes perfect sense because it's uh, I call it the rule of numbers where, where you get more Muslims, you're going to get more Muslim phenomena. And so the sorts of things that are prevalent in Muslim majority nations, such as mm. discrimination against Christians and so forth, once uh, a, West, a European nation is, you know, let's say it has 10 percent Muslims, which I think is mm-hmm. the case with France. Well, you're going to get 10 percent of that. <laughs> um, okay. and, and we're seeing it. You, as you mentioned, the churches, I believe it's last I checked. I think it's probably worse now. At least two churches every day were somehow being vandalized, desecrated. Um, you know, their cross is being, uh, uh, you know, and really discussing things like they'll make uh, the sign of the cross out of human dung. Uh, oh. They'll urinate on it. You know, things that um, don't seem indigenous to Europe, but are right. in fact rather indigenous. And I see very often in the Islamic world happening to churches because some people argue, how do you know it's Muslims? You know, um, but it's it's the same telltale signs. Well, you know, I it, it certainly doesn't sound like the Quakers I've met or read about. I'll, I'll put it that way. <laughs> Raymond, a couple of years ago, I saw a video that was taken off of YouTube, and I want you to interpret the video and why it was removed. It showed preparations for Christmas, and in Poland, it showed children parading down down the street, and there was the Holy Family, and there was Father Christmas, and so on. And then in Germany, there were car barricades, and high hurricane fences uh, around Christmas trees with armed guards around them. And YouTube took it off. Why is it Poland prepares for Christmas one way, Germany prepares for it another way, and then YouTube decided to remove the video? Help me understand what I saw. (laughs) Well, Poland is uh, extremely anti-Muslim immigration into their country. Mm -hmm. Um, they've made it very clear that they're a Catholic Christian country. They're not going to water down their their faith for anyone. And they're definitely don't, they don't want people who hate their faith or who attack. Uh, so they get it. It seems to me, Germany, on the other hand, uh, is one of the, I think has one of the very largest Muslim, probably the largest, the recent uh, migrant Muslim population, many millions. Mm -hmm. Um, and so that's why, in Poland, they can celebrate Christmas without any problems. They they don't have mm-hmm. terrorism in Poland, and in hmm. Germany, it's uh, the place is racked with it. And if uh, every time I read, of course, Christmas trees get attacked, they get burned. Mm-hmm. Churches. Uh, I've read several. Last Christmas, uh, I read se- or Easter, uh, and uh, and Christmas, but in Easter, more recently, uh, several anecdotes of Muslims walking in on during Easter service in the church and screaming Allah Akbar and, uh, you know, engaging in other profanations and so forth. So mm-hmm. that's that's the reason, and, and that's also why YouTube's taking it down, because it doesn't want people to connect the dots and realize that, oh, one country is living in peace and another mm-hmm. is not, and it all has to do with one country not taking in a certain group of the world's population and another group taking it in. 
it's very it's easily deduced so they have to of course like all of the media and social media suppress it in favor of their own narrative well you know and i think uh if memory serves hungary is ad- adopting a similar policy towards yes. uh, national identity uh, faith and so on. I mean, Poland recently consecrated its, the nation to to Christ as King of Poland, and you know, Hungary w- was under Muslim occupation for a good long time, wasn't it? Do you think that memory might be driving their policies? Oh, I, it, it definitely is. They say it. Um, the Hungarian Orban, I believe his name is, or right. if I'm pronoun- pronouncing it correctly, mm-hmm. he said that oftentimes. He says we don't want migrants because we have a long experience with Muslims. And we we and we see what's happening today, and we see the continuity, and we just want to live peacefully and safely. Um, mm-hmm. And it's funny because these people, you know, the, the Polish leadership and Hungarian, um, they're really liked by their people, and because because of these policies that they take, which are about their nations first. It's not about you know open doors and bringing in migrants. But in the Western media, they are. If you don't know what we're talking about, these guys are presented as basically Nazis, evil right. racists. And so forth. And right. I, I know the, the prime minister of Hungary uh, caused a stir because he, he didn't have the door slammed in his face when, when he went to London to meet with the prime minister. Friends, when we come back, we're going to continue our conversation with Raymond Ibrahim. We're talking about persecutions of Christians in Africa and around the world and why they're largely being ignored. In the next segment, we're going to be talking about what you need to know and what it is that you can do. We'll be right back. Stay with us. This is Jesuit Father Robert McTague, host of The Catholic Current. Join me on Tuesday at 5 p.m. Eastern to welcome back Sora Courier, known as the Crusader Gal. We'll be talking about cancel culture and about how I was shadow banned on Amazon. Sarah's always a great guest, so you don't want to miss this conversation. That's on The Catholic Current on Tuesday at 5 p.m. Eastern, coming to you from the Station of the Cross Catholic Media Network and the iCatholic Radio mobile app. After today's broadcast, go to the Catholic Current Show page on thestationofthecross.com for info on today's guests, the show resource links, and to sign up for our weekly email of upcoming shows. Praise be Jesus Christ. This is Father Robert McTigg of the Society of Jesus, your daily host for the Catholic Current, where we bring Christ to the world and the world to Christ. You're listening to us from the Station of the Cross Studios, your local radio station, and the iCatholic Radio mobile app, where we proclaim the fullness of truth with clarity and charity. My topic today is this, are Christians in Africa being ignored? My engineer and colleague and uh, associate producer, Matt Maloney, notices that I've been asking more questions in my episode titles uh, these days. My returning guest is Raymond Ibrahim, an important scholar uh, of Islam in the Middle East. Do read his book called Crucified Again, Exposing Islam's New War on Christians. Raymond, we've been talking about difficult, very sensitive things. So let's be clear. Uh, Neither you nor I are bigots. We don't hate people. We're not advocating for violence against innocent people. We're not purveyors of genocide. We just want to talk about the truth and then ask about why certain facts, particularly persecution of Christians in Africa, is being ignored. Would you agree with that statement? Oh, absolutely. And, you know, and, and to just clarify, when I, my complaint is not that, let's say, the media should not talk about Palestinians or Uyghurs or Rohingya. My complaint is that there's much worse going on in terms of human deaths, numbers, and the actual quantity, and the reason they're not being killed because... Um, Christians are not being killed because they're engaged in terrorist activities or subversive activities or over land disputes. They're being killed because of who they are. So it seems to me that's a much bigger story, and yet we're not getting it at all. And so it's, it's you know, by all means, report about what's happening to Muslims and Palestinians. I have no problem with that. But it seems hypocritical to ignore the much larger story. And when I and then when I see such hypocrisy, then I start thinking, well, there's there's an agenda. And then how how you know trustworthy is the media to start with anyway? So yes, I, I'm all for all lives, not just black lives, but all lives, all religions. Okay. Mm-hmm. And um, but I don't like the picking and choosing that the media and and people do. 
which well, I know, find discriminatory. Right. Uh, well, there, there seems to be a, a, an amnesia. You know, in uh, your your book, Sword and Scimitar, 14th Centuries of War Between Islam and the West, uh, you, you put to rest the notion that everybody was getting along just fine until those mean old crusaders came in and, and ruined the neighborhood. And that that's simply not true. And I do encourage people to, to read uh, th- that book. Uh, you know, I... I want people to to have hope. I mean, I, we're we're Christians. We're we were committed to the promises of Christ, of course. And people will say, "Father, you just got me worked up, and there's nothing I can do." For example, you know, anyone who can influence you know immigration policy in Europe is certainly not listening to the show and not inclined to do it. In, in any case. Ordinary people living around the world, listening to this on their way home from work or while they're cooking dinner, besides prayer, which is indispensable, what can people do to make the person Christian of Christians better known? Well, you know, uh, and going along with what you're saying and the frustration that one may feel from this, which I understand, um, we, also, we also have to remember, you know, as Christ himself said, the truth will set you free. So it's very important that we just get the truth at first mm-hmm. and because mm-hmm. there's so much falsehood going on that no matter what you do and how sincere you may be or objective you're being bombarded with falsehood so part of what i'm trying to do is at least present the truth and all its ugliness uh, mm-hmm. so you can have it and once you have the truth you are on the road to freedom in the sense that you can actually act and do something which is which is what you're getting with getting at and um i think one of the things that you can immediately start doing is talking about it I have friends and family yeah, because right. these things that we're discussing are so little known, it's remarkable, right. um, and this is really ultimately the point. Right? Yeah. yeah. No, the, it, it's a profound injustice. Innocent people are suffering violence. There, there is a genocide g- going on, and members of the body of Christ are being hacked to pieces. And there is something wrong with us. If, if we can't be grief-stricken, if we can't be indignant, and if we're not willing to make the effort to, to be informed. And we're going to, to link to a, a lot of your sources here in, in today's uh, show notes. For pe- I know I, I've had this conversation with many people. Oh, Father, you know, I, I'd like to tell people more about it, but then I'm dismissed a, as a hater or somehow I'm giving into Western supremacy, hegemony, colonialism, and then three other isms uh, added to that. How do you begin to, in really a persuasive way, push through that hostile sense of indifference? It's certainly not easy, and this is, you know, this is the, the fruit of decades of indoctrination of people into those paradigms where if you just say anything that we're saying, immediately you are a hater, you're a racist, you're a big A, you're a xenophobe, whatever, um, mm-hmm. because people have lost the ability to think critically. And they just think along, um, you know, memes and so forth. So it's definitely not easy. And uh, we all have, you know, our work set for us. Uh, But the best one can do is, um, you know, I found, at least in the beginning of my career, that the most useful thing was for me to stick to facts and statistics and numbers um, and actually document it. Because Mm -hmm. it's really hard to get around that. You you really have to be ideologically indoctrinated to ignore Mm -hmm. that. And those people are out there. But I think a lot more people... Uh, who would immediately dismiss you just because you said something may mm-hmm. be more open if you actually give them statistics and facts and, and you know better documented material. So I think that's definitely it's not a very easy um, uh, you know endeavor. But uh, if you go to my website, you'll find mm-hmm. a lot of that documented material. You no, know, you know, it, it, so. it, ta- it takes a lot of work. And you, you know, Raymond, I you look at dark and ugly things a lot. I look at dark and ugly things a lot. I mean, I've spent 20 years teaching medical ethics. So I, I, I've, I've, I've got the, a very uh, up-to-date authoritative map on, on dark and ugly. And every now and again, I watch videos about fountain pens because, you know, nobody dies and nobody betrays Christ. And, and it, it's it, it's a pleasant thing to talk about. I know why I get up out of bed every morning and, and do what I do. What, what about you? I mean, you're, you're, you're not reporting on new cars or, or fluffy bunnies or what do we think the little flower would say about the picture of this kitten. You're looking at hard and, and ugly things. Why, why, do you, why do you persist? Because somebody's got to do it. <laughs> right. And I'm not, I don't, I don't, you know, I, I like to be the voice for the voiceless. Mm-hmm. And as we've noted, when it comes to Christians around the world, especially in Africa and these third world countries, nobody's, nobody's, you know, actively, uh, I, I don't want to exaggerate by nobody. No, there's very many fine human rights organizations that are, but mm-hmm. um, I'm, so I'm, I'm merging my voice with theirs and I, I, I believe I'm spearheading in certain 
um, aspects by really showing the clarity and the historical and theological continuity involved in it. Um, so I, I just, just, it needs to be done. I think it's the right thing to do. And so I'm doing it. Well, you know, I'm, I'm grateful for, for that. You know, when I was, um, I was visiting at, at a seminary years ago and a recent alumnus was, was preaching and it was the only time I really thought seriously about getting up to interrupt the, the, the homily because he said, well, you know, we have to be really careful about denunciations of religious violence because really it was the Catholics who invented oh. religious violence and with the Crusades and so on. Mm. And, and, and a friend of mine was there and said, Father, I, I heard that man say that and I started to say a rosary for you because I, I knew that there, you know, there was going to be trouble. And, and I, I, didn't, I didn't grab the microphone out of his hand, but, but I really thought about it. But somehow, uh, friends, we have to believe that Christians are worth defending, number one, because they're human, and number two, because they're Christian. And, and, and violence against innocent people, genocide anywhere— is something that threatens uh, all of us. And, you know, I've seen in so many campus ministry, uh, uh, university offices, uh, people like to say the, the quote from Martin Luther King that injustice anywhere threatens justice everywhere. They never say that heterodoxy anywhere threatens orthodoxy everywhere. <laughs> and genocide anywhere threatens humanity everywhere. Mm -hmm. And I think that can't be said too often. Raymond Ibrahim, thank you for being a good guest. God bless your good work. I look forward to our next conversation. Thank you very much, Father McTeague, likewise, and thanks for having me. Right. I'm Jesuit Father Robert McTeague, your host every day here at The Catholic Current. After the broadcast today, go to the thestationofthecross.com, get our resources list, download our audio as podcast. Take this conversation to your family and friends, bring it to someone who needs to hear it, and together we'll take it around the world. Join me tomorrow. It's Timely Tuesday. A lively guest and I will have a hot uh, and and. and informed conversation about headlines affecting the church and the world. Through the intercession of Our Lady of Mount Carmel, may mighty God bless you, keep from all harm and every evil until you reach the happiness of heaven. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, go in peace and please pray for me. Thank you for listening to this podcast brought to you by the Station of the Cross.com, a listener funded nonprofit organization. If this podcast has helped you in your spiritual journey, please prayerfully consider donating at the Station of the Cross.com by calling 1 877 888 6279 or through our free iCatholic Radio mobile app.